right. Hey, welcome to Theo Live, episode 32. Today, I've got a question for everyone. Starting off with some tech issues. All right, I've got my Triton Fet head with my microphone that is giving me some feedback. Let me know if it is really bothering you. Like, you could probably hear it just like that little bit of like fuzziness. Let me know if you're here in the chat whether that is like distracting it's distracting to me but i know a lot of times when people are having like tech issues it's just like bro no one cares like we can we can still hear you but like it bothers me like listen can you hear it it's just like there and i don't like it i don't want it to be there but it is there i don't want to have to replace equipment i want to get new equipment i don't want to replace equipment um welcome to the show today we're going to be talking about fundamentalism because i just uh this thing has been like boiling inside of me i i've been trying to not go into it until like i could do a lot more research like today i just to to be totally forthright with you guys a lot of times i do a lot of research in the last couple episodes i haven't just because i've been going through some stuff (laughs) um uh, with my mom and everything like Friday was her birthday and yesterday was Mother's Day. And I do want to say thank you for everyone who reached out. Quite a few of you actually reached out and said, hey, praying for you. I really appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so today, like I'm kind of diving into the topic a little bit earlier than I wanted to. I wanted to do a little bit more background research on some things. But I just feel like it's important because there are things that are happening right now with big evangelical guys. Like you saw the thumbnail, like we're going to be talking about John Piper and fundamentalism. And like there have been issues, certainly, over the last few years. I mean, even just look at what's happened with this church that, um, you know, there's debate to be had whether some of the practices that he's put in place have been effective. And I don't want to just bash on Bethlehem, um, but there have been a lot of things. Read the Christianity Today article, read uh, the Star Tribune, like all that stuff that came out a few months ago. I didn't really talk about it here on the channel, but um, there's just been a lot of stuff going on. But now with his latest book, I haven't read it. Let me Let me say that up front. Uh, I read the TGC, um, like kind of review of the book and I want us to look at the, the introduction video that they had for it. You know, they're basically their little commercial. Um, okay. All right. All right. Let me, let me say hi to everybody before we get going too deep. Uh, Sean hopping in here and saying, doing well, Dean discussion sounds good today. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be a discussion. Because I'm curious what you guys think. Because I have a big bias going into this whole thing uh, against fundamentalism. And when I see aspects of it, like red flags jump all over the place for me. So let me know if I'm reading into some things today. Uh, Tim saying, hola, uh, doing super, lol, super busy at work, but enjoy listening to your content. Tim, I appreciate you being here. Um, you know, just make sure you're getting all the stuff done that you need to. I don't want to be a distraction for you, but you know, hop into the chat as much as you can. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, cool. So you guys don't hear anything. Sean saying, I don't hear anything. Tim saying no fuzzies. Genuine JC is in the house and he's saying I'm on headphones. Doesn't sound bad. Okay. All right. Maybe, mm, I don't know. I know it's the fat head, but it's, it's just like loose. I need to get some tape and maybe that, if I tighten it up a little bit, then maybe it'll fix it. I don't know. It's Here's something you guys need to know when you're like doing live streams all the time and just doing like YouTube. And you guys probably already know this, but like you can get really obsessed about tech. <laughs> like really obsessed. Like even like getting new things, uh, you can really want to get a lot of equipment. And then all of a sudden, every piece of equipment that you have is like, this isn't good enough. But then, you know, you see other guys on YouTube and they're like 
shooting everything out of webcam and getting, you know, tons of views. And it's just like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. You know, like that kind of stuff. Uh, but you know what could help me know that I'm doing something with my life is if you are here to hit the like button. Yeah, I said it. It, it helps my self-worth. All those jokes that I constantly give. <laughs> but if you're here, hit the like button because we're going to be talking about something that I think you're going to enjoy. I think that there's a lot to be said about fundamentalism and some of the effects that we're still seeing today. It's kind of crazy all these years later, and we're still seeing effects of fundamentalism. And uh, I think that there's like kind of like a new breed of fundamentalism. And I'm very curious to know what you guys think. So hop into the chat. Yes, I said hop again. I'm really trying not to, but it just keeps on happening. Hop into the chat and let me know what you think as we move forward through this thing. I've got a lot that I want to talk about with this, um, but I want to kind of break it up a little bit because uh, maybe some of you guys are watching this and you're just like, I don't even know about fundamentalism. What is that thing? Like I hear people call people fundamentalists, but what does that actually even mean? Well, let's go back a little bit into the history of fundamentalism just for a second. You see, back, uh, oh, when was it? In the 20s or something like that? Uh, they had a huge debate going on in Christianity over really inerrancy and whether the Bible is completely true, whether there are errors contained in it. Uh, basically effects of German higher criticism coming in and looking at the Bible and saying, you know, can we view this as uh, any other worldly document and dissect it a little bit? And um, really some people trying to find errors in the word of God. Now, I'm an inheritance. Uh, yeah, I believe in inerrancy. All right, I'm having a hard time talking. I got the, got all the, all the sniffles and stuff going on still. Like, I'm in Saskatchewan, Canada, and the weather doesn't know what it's doing, and it's really affecting my nose and having me kind of trip over myself constantly with my words. Um, but, you know, I stutter sometimes, so did I stutter? All right. So, inerrancy. Uh, it's basically saying that the Bible is without error and there were people attacking it. So in the 20s, there was a collection of different essays from different pastors who considered themselves to be fundamentalists. So in other words, they believed in the fundamentals of the faith and uh, essentially they were believing in inerrancy. And because of that, they were viewing a certain aspects of of Christian faith to be essential, to be fundamental. And if you didn't believe in those fundamentals, then you were considered a liberal, a heretic, and on and on the list could go. Uh, so at that time, fundamentalists really meant that, that you believed in the fundamentals of the faith. So there were other ways, though, that people were trying to show themselves to believe in those same core doctrines. And so there was like this split over fundamentalists and evangelicals. Now, um, you probably have heard that term. Maybe you use that for yourself to consider yourself an evangelical, someone who's believing in the gospel. There were really these two different terms that people used during that time to talk about how they viewed the word of God, how they viewed the core doctrines of the faith, whether they believed in them or not. Now, obviously, that term fundamentalist stuck around, right? Uh, now, I come from a different perspective than probably a lot of you guys. I grew up in an independent fundamental Baptist church. Uh, I went to an independent fundamental Baptist college. I graduated from a Baptist college and seminary. Um, but, I mean, there's there was still a lot of, uh, like, they came out of the IFB movement, but there were still a lot of effects from it. So, I have a lot that I bring into this conversation as far as my own personal background. Uh, I view fundamentalism as an attitude, not necessarily even a theological position. And the reason why is because that has changed over time. You know, at in the 20s, you were viewed a fundamentalist if you held to the core doctrines of the faith. But then things began to shift 
a little bit. Uh, basically, if you didn't agree on the same ideas uh, and uh, even separating from other liberals who kind of took a slightly different stance on some of the effects of those ideas. So uh, maybe maybe we should go over here and just kind of give us a little bit of a picture. OK, uh, so this is usually what people talk about when they're talking about like separation and fundamentalism and all that kind of stuff. But we could think of it like a couple different circles, okay? Uh, let me turn off my Bluetooth because maybe it's still thinking that. Why is that going? I don't want to be connected to my Apple Pencil. Oh no, disconnect. Okay, all right. Uh, I forgot to get my Apple Pencil before I started the stream. And it was like a minute into the song. And I was like, oh, I could go and grab it. And it's all the way upstairs. And I was like, ah, oh, I won't make it in time. All right. So we could have, uh, oh, actually, this is cool. I like this app, by the way. This is good notes, uh, if you're curious. But let's think about it as a couple different circles. All right. So in this first circle, we have like the core doctrines. All right, so this would be, you know, like the Trinity would be a core doctrine. Or um, uh, the, I, I would actually even put, you know, the virgin birth uh, as a core doctrine uh, because Jesus has to be different than other people like we see in the book of Romans. He can't be part of Adam's family if he's ha having a new family and, and then it becomes, you know, what family are you going to belong to? If you're in Christ, then you don't have the effects of that family head of Adam and all that stuff. So there's a lot that you can put as far as core doctrines of the faith. But then there would be a, another circle that we could do. And we could make it a little bit bigger. And we can talk about other things that uh, maybe aren't essential to being a Christian, um, but they are important and maybe even for fun, let's start with a really controversial one and let's talk about Calvinism. <laughs> um, so Calvinism is something that I think is very important, but not every Christian agrees on Calvinism, right? Not every person who is saved is a Calvinist and that's okay. Uh, other things you can talk about is, uh, maybe, uh, women in the church, you know, important topic, something that should be discussed, but it isn't part of the essentials of being a Christian. It's not something that if you don't believe in a certain position on this, then you're no longer saved. Uh, I would even say things like hell, a literal hell might fall into this second sphere. Um, the reason why I say that, you might jump at that and I'm trying to kind of catch you by surprise a little bit. Um, but the reason why I say that is someone doesn't necessarily need to know what they're saved from in order to be a Christian. Uh, if there's danger, like a kid going into the street, uh, they might not understand that there's a car coming from them. But if you, if you save that child, they're saved, right? They might not, they might know it was a bad thing, uh, that could have happened to them that would have happened to them. Uh, but they get saved from it. So, uh, I've kind of shifted a little bit as far as that goes. Now I still believe in a literal hell. Um, but, uh, there are certain things that you can say are essential. And then there are certain things that you can look at and say, these are, uh, maybe secondary issues. And then even further out, you could have some other things that aren't quite as important, but would maybe fall into a third sphere. Um, but that's essentially what it means. All right. If you're a Christian, and then, you know, there are other Christians who have different ideas than you. And then there are other Christians that maybe you wouldn't hang out with or do things with, or you wouldn't go to their church, but you can still think that they're Christians. Like that's what was happening in the twenties, except things were becoming a little out of hand to where people were looking at like this core and they were kind of having it go out a little bit and start to take over a little bit of these second tier issues. And then all of a sudden that core for some people was beginning to look a lot more like two circles instead of the one. And that's 
what fundamentalism is. It takes like the core doctrines that you must believe in order to be a Christian, and it starts to expand them into these second tier issues to say that, all right, well, you have to believe in all of these things in order to be a Christian. And then it starts to view other people as not being saved because they don't agree on these second tier issues rather than these core doctrines. Now, this has happened over and over again since the 20s. And actually, if you look through Christian history, there's kind of like this these rhythms that happen, just patterns over and over again, where someone will say, this is a critical issue of the time. And sometimes it really is. A lot of times it really is. But then over time, people become more dogmatic about uh, maybe some applications of that idea. And then all of a sudden, it becomes like that that new core doctrine and so people begin to separate and say you're not a christian or you're not a good enough christian so i'm going to separate from you and this has happened time and time again now what i want to show you uh and the reason why i've got this one this book out today is i want to talk a little bit about martin lloyd jones and how he kind of bridges the gap uh between fundamentalists and evangelicals and how he distinguished himself uh, because there are some people, even I was seeing a little bit today, uh, some people who are quoting him and saying basically that he was a fundamentalist. And uh, I think it's interesting, an interview that he gave, there's not a lot of video of Martin Lloyd-Jones, lots of audio, thank the Lord, um, but not a lot of video about him. If you don't know who Martin Lloyd-Jones is, uh, he was a former physician, became a pastor over in England, very prominent figure. Uh, essentially, uh, similar kind of ministry to people like, uh, to a lesser extent, like Charles Spurgeon, like that kind of thing. He was a Methodist. Uh, him and John Stott had a famous falling out toward the end of his ministry. A lot. You can learn a lot. Just go and do like a Wikipedia search on Martin Lloyd Jones. And, uh, yeah. So let's, let's look at an interview that he gave though. Um, talking about whether he was a fundamentalist. Now, he's uh, closer to the time of the original writings, and one uh, the guy he took over for at his church, um, Campbell Morgan, he was uh, one of the writers of the fundamentals, uh, those original documents saying, hey, we believe in this aspect of the faith. But listen to what he has to say. Fundamentalist. Let's go back. Now, are you a fundamentalist? Well, I, 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 like many others, I don't like the term. I no. prefer to call myself a conservative evangelical. Uh, that is very largely because of the uh, abuse of the term, I think, in the United States. Um, but I, I am a conservative evangelical, as uh, Dr. Campbell Morgan himself was. And, uh... So he's differentiating himself from those in the United States. And this is something... Sorry, I'm a, I'm a U.S. citizen. I was born in the United States. Um, but this is something that prominently happens in U, uh, United States Christianity. Uh, a little bit of North American Christianity, but specifically the United States is kind of like right-wing kind of takeover of this is conservatism rather than necessarily like the fundamentals of the faith. And he's trying to differentiate himself from that. Now, are you a... Let's go back Those men here. who wrote to the, the contributions to, the, to, to that symposium you're talking about were. What, what would you say the difference between yourself and the people who call themselves fundamentalists is? Well, it's, uh, one doesn't want to be offensive, but I think uh, our attitude is, is a little more intelligent. Uh, I mean, I have very little sympathy with the man who just holds up a Bible and says, I believe this from cover to cover, every comma and full stop and all the rest of it. There's been a little bit too much of that and, and, uh, and a refusal to, uh, to, to use one's mind and to, uh, and to recognize uh, figures of speech and so on. Uh, I think their danger has been to be literalistic in, in, in a wrong sense. That, that would be the main difference, I think, between us. So what he's saying is like the problem with fundamentalism at his time. And I would say that the problem still holds, at least from my experience, the circles that I've run in, 
like the problem still holds is a lack of education, uh, a lack of um, critical thinking, because you just say, well, like it's like that bumper sticker. Uh, the Bible says it, I believe it, you know, like that, that kind of a deal. And while that's true, like the Bible is true, the Bible is inerrant. No one's debating that. Martin Lloyd-Jones definitely taught that. But there is a difference between saying this is, you know, what the Bible says and saying this is my interpretation of what the Bible says. And so what he's arguing for is a little bit more critical thinking and not just taking something out of its context and saying, hey, the Bible says this. Uh, so, you know, we're moving forward with this idea. And so the, he's arguing for a little bit more critical thinking from the fundamentalist side. And he's also kind of, you know, kind of beating around the bush a little bit and saying there's a certain attitude of fundamentalists uh, that are just so brazen in how they say things. And they don't think about the implications of what they say. Now, I do also want to show you uh, from uh, Ian Murray's uh, biography. There's, he's got a two-part uh, biography of Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, this interaction that I just find so interesting. Um, and, and we'll get into Piper and MacArthur and all those guys here in a minute. Uh, but I'm just trying to let you see, like, this is not something new. Uh, in Toronto, there was a guy, T.T. Um, Shields, who was a preacher, Jarvis Street Baptist Church, um, you know, uh, very involved with one of the schools over there, McMaster's. Um, he was a fundamentalist, and he had a huge ministry. Uh, I mean... I, I'm, I'm kind of going off the top of my head. I would, I would have to imagine it was probably one of the biggest ministries in Canada. They called him the Spurgeon of Canada. And uh, him and Martin Lloyd-Jones had a couple interactions. Uh, one, when Martin Lloyd-Jones was coming over to the United States and he was uh, preaching and he was going through Canada as well. Uh, they had like this conversation, this sit down. And I just want to read a little bit to you because... First, Martin Lloyd-Jones wasn't sure if he was going to go because he knew that T.T. Shields was a fundamentalist and T.T. Shields was known as being someone who was very adversarial. Like, he, he, he's a fighter. And he was just attacking all kinds of people. And so Martin Lloyd-Jones has kind of been that guy, like he just said, he doesn't call himself a fundamentalist. And so a lot of these other fundamentalists were looking at him and saying that he was liberal. And so he comes over. And also, just to be clear, uh, a lot of people said that about Spurgeon too, specifically in the Southern Baptist Convention. Just saying, like a lot of those people like love Spurgeon now and his library is even at Midwestern. But if you look back at the time, a lot of people were saying that Spurgeon was too loose because smoking cigars, especially his views on slavery. Eh, like there's a reason why Spurgeon didn't come over to the United States guys, uh, because he had death threats. If he ever stepped on United States sto uh, soil, uh, there were death threats because of his views on uh, slavery. So just letting you know a few things today. Uh, but let's, let's look in. Uh, I'll, I'll just read this to you. This is interesting to me. All right, this is an interaction between T.T. Uh, Shields and Martin Lloyd-Jones, and this is Martin Lloyd-Jones' own words. Shields came to fetch me, and we had lunch. We talked on general subjects, and then we went to sit in the garden. There, as we drank coffee, he suddenly turned to me and said, Are you a great reader of Joseph Parker? I replied, No, I am not. Why? he asked. I get nothing from him. Man, he said, What's the matter with you? Well, I said, it's all very well to make these criticisms of the liberals, but it, he doesn't help me spiritually. So basically, Lloyd-Jones is saying, like, I don't just, like, hate watch things. <laughs> uh, I don't hate read people or hate listen to people, which, like, we all know, like, that's a huge aspect of what's going on in, um, you know, just Christianity today. Not the magazine, but just Christianity right now <laughs> like a lot of people 
hate watch people, hate read people. Uh, they're just trying to find errors in people. And so like Martin Lloyd Jones, this, this guy was fairly liberal, this Joseph Parker. And he was just saying like, Hey, I don't, I don't listen to him because like, I don't really get anything out of him. Uh, surely you are helped by the way he makes mince meat of the liberals. No, I am not. I responded, you can make mince meat of the liberals and still be in trouble in your own soul. I think he was basically pointing right at T.T. Shields with that. Well, Shields said, I read Joseph Parker every Sunday morning. He winds me up, puts me right. I felt my opening had come, so we began. We had a great debate. He was a very able man, and we argued the issue about which I disagreed with him. In defense of his attitude, he said, Do you know every time I indulge in what you call one of those dog fights, the sales of the gospel witness go right up? What about that? So he's Basically, Martin Lloyd-Jones took opportunity in this moment to have a conversation with T.T. Shields about how he was always just like berating people publicly and saying that person's a liberal, that person's a heretic. I like these people who are constantly saying like the worst things about these people. If that is not applicable to today, I don't know what is because that's, I mean, just look around on YouTube and, and even my own videos. You know, if I put John MacArthur in the in the thumbnail, I'm going to get more views. If I talk about someone who's famous, I'm going to get more views. Why is that? Well, part part of the time it's because something needs to be like confronted about these people, but a lot of times it's because people like to see people torn down. And that's really what uh Martin Lloyd Jones is getting to and what I think that fundamentalists often do without actual like material there to really go deep on. Uh, they just see a person. They Whenever they say something, they're going to go at them. It's like Tim Keller. All right, <laughs> let's move on here. Um, he says, uh, uh, we had a great debate. He was a very able man, and we argued about the issue, which I disagreed with him. In defense of his attitude, he said, do you know every time I indulge in what you call one of these dogfights, the sales of the gospel witness go right up? What about that? Well, I replied, I have always observed that if there's a dog fight or a crowd gather, or uh, if there's a dog fight, a crowd gathers. I'm not at all surprised. People like that sort of thing. Then he brought up another argument. He said, now you are a doctor and you are confronted by a patient who got cancer. You know that if that cancer is not removed, it is going to kill the patient. You don't want to operate, but you have to do so because it is going to save the patient's life. That's my position. I don't want to be doing this kind of thing, but there is this cancer and it has got to be removed. What do you say about that? I responded, what I say to you is this. I am a physician, but there is such a thing as a surgical mentality or of becoming what is described as knife happy. I agree. There are some cases where you've got to operate, but the danger of the surgeon is to operate immediately. He thinks in time of operating. Never have an operation without having a second opinion from a physician. Oh, snap. I love it. Basically, what Martin Lloyd-Jones is saying is, you're trigger happy. You're trigger happy. And you're making, uh, you know, all these assumptions about people's theological positions. And you're now looking at them and saying that they're liberals. You're going too fast with this. You need to think about the words that you're saying and the way that you're berating people publicly, you need to tone these words back a little bit and think critically about it. Not just because someone doesn't fit into like what we talked about, that second tier issue that you just assume, all right, well, they're a liberal. And that was T.T. Shield's problem. Now, there's a lot of good things that came out of T.T. Shield's ministry, um, but I do find that interaction between Martin Lloyd-Jones and him very interesting and i think it's appropriate because people today are having those same kind of debates uh, they're looking at people and saying you don't believe in the second thing that i've made primary and because of that you're a liberal even worse you're a heretic these terms are getting thrown around so flippantly now and uh it has an effect and i want to talk about that effect here in just a second but before i do I do want to hop in with you guys and see what's going on here in the chat. Bill saying, hey, Dean. Hey, Bill. How's it going? Uh, I am in my seventh decade of life, my fifth in the ministry. I have seen fundamentalism, especially in America, change into a plethora of many unrecognizable factions. Yeah, I bet you've seen quite a bit of that over the years. Tim, 
I think I can say the same about it for Mexico and Central America. Wrestle with scriptures here. It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. Um, yeah. Uh, extremes are unbiblical and often breed more unbiblical practices. I am a fundamentalist in the sense that I am not the one who supports mere Christianity. And he's referencing C.S. Lewis with that. Not everything is gospel, but we should strive to have old truths revealed to us like Martin Luther had. Um, yeah, I'd, I would agree with that. Uh, not everything is gospel issue. Uh, but we do need to make sure that we understand our positions. That's very true. Um, but what I want to talk about here for the rest is talking about some of these examples of people today taking issues that are important and making them into issues that are primary. And then once they become primary, they start cutting off everyone who disagrees with them. And we've seen this. The reason why I put John MacArthur in the thumbnail is because John MacArthur is one of the most prominent guys who's who's done this. Uh, he he had the statement on social justice. Now, um, you know, on this channel, I, I I say it all the time. I am all about uh, uh, like just trying to be real and authentic with you guys. And my channel is about biblical theology for normal people. And so what I mean by that is, yes, the average Christian, but also like the, the extremes. Uh, there, are, there are so many niches out here uh, on YouTube that are saying like, hey, if you agree with me about this, we're cool. And if you disagree with me, me about this, not just are we not going to hang out, but you're the worst. <laughs> and uh, a lot of that has to do with things that are going on right now uh, with critical race theory and wokeism and you know all that kind of stuff and basically today i wanted to just kind of plant my 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 flag down in the dirt and say that's not what my channel is about um you know i have a lot of people who've hopped over into my channel last uh, month or so and i kind of just want to be forthright and say if that's what you're looking for you you probably need to find a different channel um, because like when John MacArthur wrote that statement on social justice, I, I wanted to be able to say like, Hey, I, I really like this. Like I, cause John MacArthur is my homeboy, you know, like I, I, I really liked him. And, and when I started reading through that statement, I was like, I can't, I can't sign this. I can't sign this at all. Like this, the, like I, I took, I literally had my iPad out. I wish I had saved the document. Uh, but I got my iPad out. I saved it as a PDF. I opened it up and I started marking it up with my Apple pencil and I just marked, I mean, you couldn't recognize this document anymore <laughs> because there were so many assumptions in this document. And then, you know, if that's your position, that's fine. You know, that like, that's, that's one thing, you know, we all have disagreements. That is absolutely fine. If you agree with the statement on social justice, that's your own opinion. And that is okay. Uh, I think you're wrong. Uh, I think that there, there are oversimplifications in that, especially when it become, comes to the Imago Dei. I have a lot of concerns with that statement. Maybe I should make a video about that. Uh, but uh, I, have, I have some things about that. But if you disagree with me, we can still be friends, you know? Uh, but what John MacArthur did was, all right, well, if you don't sign this, you're not going to be friends with me, at least publicly. And part of that was the whole falling out with Mark Dever and Lig Duncan and Al Mohler in, in a very public way. Uh, I probably should have brought up, we could, we could have watched the video, um, but uh, Phil Johnson moderating a, a panel. It's pretty famous, so you could go and look it up after uh, where he basically asks, you know, why didn't you sign the statement? And... Uh, I don't think that was a surprise to John MacArthur. Now, John MacArthur did try to like, uh, you know, this is a little awkward, you know, this is a little awkward going on here at the conference. Uh, but the main point is that those guys weren't asked back, you know, even though they had been coming to Shepherd's Conference for years and interacting with John MacArthur's ministry for years, 
and John MacArthur cut himself off from them as far as pub- publicly. We don't know privately. They could still be friends. I don't know. Uh, I would imagine that it would have to be strained, but that's just speculation. Um, but then John MacArthur, he was supposed to speak. Uh, they were supposed to have a conference there at Grace Community Church with the Gospel Coalition. Like TGC was supposed to come to uh, John MacArthur's church and have an actual conference where John MacArthur was like headlining. That didn't happen. He cut himself off. And we're seeing it over and over again, this this kind of pigeonholing of oneself into where now it's just everyone who agrees exactly like me. Look at the speakers at Shepherd's Conference this year versus Shepherd's Conference six or seven years ago. There's a big difference. Look at the amount of people who are just basically in-house speakers. Now, if you want to do it that way, that's fine. But it be, it's very clear that there has been like this distinction. And he's even said it publicly about TGC, about uh, Together for the Gospel. He, he talked about that, you know, like all these things because of CRT, because of wokeism. Uh, he, he's now, you know, saying like, I'm not going to fellowship with these guys. He's made those issues primary. And when you do that on something that's not, and guys, uh, the idea of uh, whether there is systematic racism is not a gospel issue. It isn't. You aren't going to find it in the gospels. All right. Uh, is it an important talking point that we could have disagreements on? Absolutely. But it is not primary. And John MacArthur made it primary with a lot of his relationships. And now you can see publicly, at least, that those relationships have been severed. And that's what fundamentalism does. It happened in the 20s with people like Martin Lloyd-Jones and T.T. Shields and others. And now it's happening again, or maybe it's always been happening and we're just being made aware of it. Um, But now it's happening with John MacArthur, Mark Dever, and all those guys. Uh, But it's also having an effect on some other people. Now, I did put Owen Strand in talk a little bit about the effects of uh, having second tier issues become primary. Because if you don't think that those second tier issues, once you make them primary, are going to affect your primaries, you're wrong. You're dead wrong. (laughs) Uh, So Owen Strand has had some of that. And I want to talk about that here in a sec. Uh, Genuine JC, what do you think about secondary issues that reveal a problematic hermeneutic? Um, I, I would, I'm assuming that you're talking about the role of women in the church. Uh, that's usually what people reference as far as, um, you know, a secondary issue that can have an effect. Uh, I would say go back and watch my women in the church. If that's what you're thinking, genuine JC. If, uh, if that's what you're thinking, go back and watch my Women in the Church Theo Live. And at the end, I bring up a video of, I think it's D.A. Carson and, uh, is it Keller? And they're talking about why it's such a big deal uh, for complementarianism in uh, the, the statement that you have to sign in order to uh, fellowship with gospel coalition or why they have a complementarian view if all they're about is being, uh, you know, for the gospel, um, go back and watch that. But also just to answer it in a general way, um, if it's a problematic hermeneutic, then you got to take it one person at a time. I'm not going to make a blanket statement, uh, and say, okay, because it is a slippery slope, then, this person is going to always, you know, fall into this category. I'm not going to do that. Um, there are other people who do, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take it as a one person at a time kind of deal to see, uh, you know, how far they go. Because here's something, you know, I've said it, I'm a Calvinist. And once again, if you're playing the Theo live drinking game, you're probably a couple drinks in at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm a Calvinist, but I don't believe in double predestination. I think that's heretical. Uh, so there there are plenty of Calvinists who do, though. And it's one of those things of you got to see how far down the street people go. Because I would even say that the only reason 
why I don't go further in saying I believe in double predestination is because the Bible. <laughs> like I stop where the Bible stops. But if you were to take the logical conclusion of Calvinism, you will end up at the end of the street with double predestination if you don't let the Bible stop you. Um, and that's what people do a lot of times with different things. They, they can go a little bit down the street. And then they'll stop at like the next block instead of going all the way down. And at the end, there's disaster. There's heresy. There's all kinds of awful ideologies at the end of that street. But not everyone is going to drive all the way down. Some people are going to go a block. Some people will go two. Uh, maybe two is too far. Um, but you need to figure out where they're stopping uh, when it comes to like that problematic hermeneutic of, of something that could lead. You know, um, uh, I mean, I mean, you could even say this about like Bible translations. Like I had this thing where, uh, the CSB, I wasn't going to use the CSB because of a translation philosophy that they had of, um, trying to make it more readable, uh, by inserting more conjunctions than you see in the Hebrew and the Greek. And, uh, like they even had it on their website. I don't, I haven't checked their website in a very long time. I love the CSB, by the way, it's my go-to. Uh, but for a long time, I wasn't going to use it because uh, they had this conjunction thing and it made it seem like it was two distinct different things when it was really one thought. And so my view of that was like, oh, if you do that there, you might do it in other places and it's going to be problematic. Um, now, fortunately, I haven't found those other places uh, where it could be a problem, but it isn't there. Um, so. I would say it's very similar with that idea of a problematic hermeneutic. Now, do I think women should be pastors? No, like, but I don't think that's a gospel issue. And even though I would view it as a problematic hermeneutic uh, to interpret first Timothy chapter two, uh, the way that a lot of them have to, because of the wording there, uh, I don't think that's always going to be the case for where they're going to end up. And uh, so for me, I have to take it one person at a time uh, one church at a time and figure out how far are you going with this thing and where are you guys at? Uh, but I'm not going to put a blanket statement because, you know, one person went too far or maybe even a lot of people go too far. I want to have the grace and uh, just the, the kindness to be able to have that conversation with that pastor because this is usually where it is, right? Like it could be churches, but most of the time it's just like the pastor in their position. So uh, I need to take it one one thing at a time. I hope that was helpful, Genuine JC. Um, Jeffrey hopping in here and saying blessings and that he loves the CSB too. I appreciate you saying that. Where are all my CSB guys at, you know? All right, so uh, let's talk about Owen Strand because Owen, uh, he's a character. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I don't follow him on Twitter, but every once in a while I see some stuff and, uh, it's, it's become clear over the last few years. Some of the reason why he left Midwestern, uh, I think is because of his views on gender and, um, you know, gender is an important topic. Uh, it is something that you need to discuss and have a firm position on, uh, as far as, you know, like essentially things like male headship and and you know how far does that go and what that looks like well owen strand has basically made that a primary issue now i don't think that uh we're talking about like the gospel for him but it's become so primary that we've seen it affect his theology it is observable uh now if you're an owen strand fan uh, i'm sorry to tell you um, but this guy, you need to get your guy <laughs> because he is out on the internet giving all kinds of, um, false validations of eternal subordination of the sun. Now, if you don't know what that is, that is a theological viewpoint that, um, I would say like, if you hold firmly to it, it is heresy. It just is. Uh, because it takes the view of the Trinity and splits it apart. Um, eternal subordination of the Son is essentially the idea 
that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinct. And so distinct that they have different wills. And once you start doing that, I don't think we're talking about the same substance. Because the Father has a will, and that will is authoritative over the other persons of the Trinity and will always have an impact. Uh, that's the idea of eternal. Uh, and it, because of that, uh, the father has subordinated the son. So the son is uh, acting in uh, like a, a second kind of position, not just a second person of the Trinity. Uh, by the way, that is not where we get like first, second, and third persons of the Trinity. It's just a way of being able to like give some numeric value. It's not uh, like order, <laughs> um, but at least I don't, I, I don't think you sh can say that biblically. But eternal subordination of the Son is that the Son will always act in a hum uh, a humble posture toward the Father's will. That the Father has a will that's distinct from the Son's will, that's distinct from the Holy Spirit's will, and that the Son will always submit His will to the will of the Father for all of eternity. Um, now, you might hear that and you might be like, I don't really see that much of a problem. Um, because didn't he submit himself to the will of the Father while he was here on earth? And to that, I would say yes, while he was on earth. But he also chose to not show his full Godhead. Uh, and, I mean, there's the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, but th like on a daily basis, he chose to humble himself and... and uh, submit to what the father did tell him to go and do. But this is talking about like the earthly, uh, version of Jesus or how should I put it? Uh, the earthly nature of Jesus is submitting to the father's will because the, the will of the father is the will of the son. They are of the same essence. And when you start breaking apart wills, you're talking about distinct, uh, not just like, uh, of being a person, you're talking about a different entity. And if you start talking about the Trinity in that way, you're no longer talking about an orthodox view of the Trinity. And so there are people who are out here uh, who talk about uh, the eternal subordination of the Son and say that it's biblical. There are Christians, um, and again, <laughs> I have to go like this. Like, this is how far I take it. Uh, when you start getting into theological positions, that's where I get like, oh, no. Where are we at? Not just the like practical things of like how we do things, but what we believe. Uh, that's that's where we should really have a huge focus. And so, when it comes to these things, there are people who are out here saying that they're Christians and support this. Um, I might anger some people, but Wayne Grudem is like the biggest one. Uh, Wayne Grudem, his systematic theology book is one that a lot of people have, and he talks about eternal subordination of the Son in that. And actually, there are a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there, there are several key fundamentalist figures that support this view. And it is heretical. The eternal subordination of the Son is a heretical position. It goes against the Nicene Creed. It goes completely against it. Uh, it, it goes against the uh, um, oh, uh, Capodician Theorem. Uh, like it, it, it goes against so much of historical Christianity and yet there are people who promote it. Now, why do they do that? Well, I believe that the reason specifically for Owen is that it's an effect of his view about male headship because he wants to take first Corinthians and where it talks about, uh, the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. He wants to interpret it through that lens of, uh, a fundamentalist view of headship. And now he's taking that, that view of headship that the man is in control and that the man is, you know, the decision maker. And like I've said so often in these streams and through different videos, a very bad interpretation of Ephesians 5 and saying that all the things that Jesus does for the church aren't just descriptive, but it's prescriptive for the man. Like the main idea of Ephesians 5 there. And talking about what Christ has done is that Christ sacrificed himself for the church. And then it's just a description of what Christ did for the church. You are not supposed to do that. If you're a husband, 
You're not supposed to do that for your wife. You are not the saint, the, the priest of the home that is going in between you, uh, like your wife and God and like interacting as like the high priest of the home. That is a view that is out there for a lot of these guys, but it is a twisting of that view that I think leads to that idea of eternal subordination of the son. Uh, a reason for this is you aren't going to find that view amongst egalitarians. I'm just saying there are certain heretical views that depending on what your belief system is and where you line up on certain theological positions that you're going to be more prone to. No, their egalitarians have their own problem. <laughs> but um, but that that is a, a problem that you're going to see with complementarians uh, depending on how far they take it and what their view about male headship they are, they could fall prey to that heretical doctrine. Uh, so that's what happens when you take a secondary issue and you make it primary, or at least so, so much more important than it needs to be, that it starts affecting some of your primary beliefs, like even the Trinity. Like it's a big deal. Um, let's, let's go, let's go over here. Uh, oh, let's go all the way up here. I use KJV, NIV, NLT, and CSB when I am teaching, preaching. I use KJV. Well, hey, you know, whatever translation you use, most likely it's going to be a good one. Uh, but Sean, you're with me, man. CSB, what's up? Wrestle with scripture. I guess I think that my accountability as a pastor shepherd, I know that going astray is a process. You do not just end up astray. I agree with that. But a lot of times we're carried off. Um, because of some of those secondary things that we think are important and they are important, but we make them too important. And then we start having them affect us, uh, like a ship traveling long distance. It does not to need to be pointed drastically in the wrong direction, but over time will end up way off the mark. Um, and then you also say, I take that seriously when teaching the word and how foundational gospel issues should affect our mindset with secondary issues. Yes, that's the way it should happen. Like the primary should affect the other things, not the other way around. Um, eternal subordination, like how do you even get there? It's a good question. Uh, however, I still see people as brothers and sisters and welcome that conversation. Folks are quick to divide if someone disagrees. Pastors in the flock, yeah. Christian, my man. Uh, coming from Midwestern, it is said that the biggest reason was EFS. Uh, people treat him and Barrett like they're arch enemies on the subject. I mean, they kind of are, <laughs> at least, uh, at least from my view, uh, they kind of are. Um, uh, Barrett wrote um, a great book about the Trinity. Even like I think I wrote down one of the quotes. I have the ebook, but uh, let me let me pull something up. I didn't have this ready to go. Um, but yeah. Uh, Matthew Barrett in Simple Trinity, as soon as you insert graduations of authority within the imminent Trinity gradu uh, gradations that are uh, person defining and therefore essential for the Trinity to be a Trinity, you forfeit one will in God. You forfeit the Trinity's one simple essence. Our God is simply Trinity, dot, 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 no more. <laughs> like, I love that. Uh, and I do think that it kind of is right at Owen Strand and some of the things that he's said lately. Um, but yeah, uh, I know that Owen Strand for a long time, like a lot of people loved a lot of his other stuff. I'm just saying that's, that's a big issue. Uh, Sean, can you give some guidance to pastors who have people in their congregations that hold extreme fundamental views, such as headship, women in the church, raising families, etc. Many of these issues are first tier issues for them. Uh, the biggest thing that I would say is just continue to preach the gospel, uh, continue to preach like what it means to hold on to core values. And the, probably the biggest impact that you're going to have is over an extended period of time of preaching properly. Um, you know, you could have conversations when you see someone who is like, like, especially when it comes to like the male headship thing. And they're like, with that, it's very easy to fall into like, um, not necessarily abuse, but mistreatment of the spouse. Um, if you see some of that's coming up, you're going to have to have some really hard conversations. <laughs> um, but I would say, you know, a lot of these people, 
you know, it's, it's, it's their, it, it's like their golden egg, you know, like they just gotta, like, I just think of like the Jawas and Mandalorian <laughs> and they're like, they, they have that egg and they went inside and they're just like consumed with that egg. That's what people have about like these kind of issues. Sometimes it's like their precious little baby and they're just going to hold on to that thing. And if you talk bad about that baby, oh, you're going to be in trouble. Um, but I would say do that from the pulpit do that from the pulpit often and if you see specific issues in your congregation like these things maybe it's something else uh, that people are treating like a first tier issue and it's not make sure to use those as examples as you move on now you're gonna probably have conversations about the after with people uh, but there is something so authoritative and also essentially passive because they're not sure whether you know you're talking directly about them and that helps sometimes in helping someone to be persuaded to a certain view. And that's what you want. You want them to come to a good view on these things. And so you are, in a way, trying to persuade them. Not manipulate, but persuade. And so you give your you know, presentation from the pulpit, I think, and let that have an effect over time. It's not going to happen like in two sermons. You know, you preach two sermons and you're thinking, oh, I fixed the problem. That's not going to happen. It never happens that way. Uh, but over, you know, several months, maybe even years uh, of preaching properly and, you know, taking opportunity to use certain subjects as examples, I think that in time you could have a really good effect uh, on those individuals. But if you see things that are beginning to be like really bad, then yeah, you're going to have to go take them to Starbucks and take them to task. And sometimes you have to have conflict and it's not fun. And hopefully you can do it, you know, in as kind a way as possible to make sure those people aren't super offended about their precious baby of whatever that first, like that second tier issue that they're pretending is a first tier issue is. But, you know, some people are going to leave. <laughs> It happens. I'm sorry to say it, but it happens. Yeah, no problem, man. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about someone else. <laughs> Today I'm just kind of going at some things that have been kind of just boiling under the surface a little bit of, I cannot believe this person did this. I cannot believe this person did that. Can they not see that this is fundamentalism? And the next one is John Piper. John Piper, a fundamentalist. Let's look at his latest book. Um, now, I like. Let me be clear. Like, I've got. I'm just grabbing one, but I've got like almost all of his books. I don't have Providence yet, but that might change. Um, but I mean, like, I love John Piper. I've like loved him for a long time been benefited a lot had some disagreements over the last few years about certain things that have been going on uh some of the ways that he's let elders at bethlehem do some things um it seems like there's more stuff going on but that's just speculation for me because i wasn't there um but all that being said you know when i look at things like this this begins to be really concerning to his own people now are you? Jesus came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But to as many as received him, comma, who believed in his name, comma, he gave power to become the children of God. So you can see what John is doing in John 1, 11, and 12. In putting who believed in his name in apposition with who received him, he's giving us a profound central revelation into the nature of saving faith or saving belief. He's showing us at the heart of saving faith is a receiving grace or better, oh. you could say saving faith is a receiving grace. It's not a giving grace. In believing in Jesus and receiving Jesus, we're not giving God anything. We're not adding to God. Saving faith is the echo of the emptiness of the soul looking away to the all-sufficiency 
of Christ. And so it is a receiving of Christ, which then leads to this question. Receive him as what? All right. So you guys know about the lordship controversy, right? Um, with John MacArthur back in the day, and you got to receive Jesus as Lord in order to be saved. Um, I wouldn't say that's necessarily like a heretical viewpoint um, or, you know, something that would be disastrous for your faith. I do think it's legalism um, because we don't see that. Uh, you know, basically submitting yourself to the Lordship of Christ is what you do as a Christian. Um, and it is not part of like that, that moment. I, I continually, the gospel is as simple as John three fifteen, not John three sixteen. And it's also the gospel, but John three fifteen, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So also must the son of man be lifted up so that anyone who would look on him would be saved, would believe that's, that's the gospel. It's that simple. It's looking unto Christ and understanding who Christ is um, and, and believing in him. It's just looking at him. Now, the problem that John Piper is doing and why I would say this is a fundamentalist view is like, at least from this book, I'm going to get the book. Like, I'm going to read it. Uh, I, I'm very concerned. Like, I read the TGC article um uh basically review of it and it like red flags all over the place guys i don't like that by the way i don't want there to be red flags <laughs> like i i like piper's teaching uh i have some other disagreements about some things that have happened at his church lately but i like his teachings mostly you know, like his views on complementarianism this book some of it is a little too much for me but i mean i've been so benefited by a lot of his teaching um and i don't want there to be things that i have red flags about but when he start when he's talking in this way he's essentially saying that you need to love jesus in order for you to be saved now should you love jesus of course and anyone who would get saved should look at Jesus and have affection toward him. But what he's going to be arguing for in this book is that you must love Jesus and that is part of your belief in him. The problem with that is you're adding. Like even the scripture passage that he's talking about, those who received him, like he's going off that word received and going to like this crazy extent with him. Receive him as what? Like, it means that he received their teaching. Like, like Jesus' teaching. These people received Jesus' teaching. And I think, like, he knows that. Like, it's pretty simple. But he's saying, like, received him as what? And using that as kind of like this launching pad to talk about what he's going to talk about here. Because the word receive is neutral. It doesn't answer the question, am I receiving him as precious? in himself or only as competent and he might be able to get me something I would love more than him but I sure want him because he's competent or it doesn't answer the question whether I'm receiving him as satisfying in himself or just skillful because he's gonna fix my finances so I think I know what he's getting at I think I, I, I what he's getting at is like the idea of and he's going to say it in a sec of like uh, hell being, you know, something that we need to be saved from. And so if that's all you're concerned about in salvation is that what Jesus accomplishes for you as far as, you know, getting out of hell scot-free, um, like that's problematic. And I would agree with that. I don't think that saving faith is just looking at hell and saying, I don't want that. So I want Jesus. Um, but that's not in the passage. <laughs> like, like he's talking about like receive him and receive like his, like, just like as precious. That's not in the passage. It's receiving his teaching. And like I said, I think he knows that. Or fix my marriage. 
or it doesn't answer the question whether I'm going to receive him as a, a treasure or just a ticket out of hell. And I'll put my ticket in my back pocket here and I'll sit on it and ignore it the rest of my life. But, oh, I'm glad I got out of hell. But as far as the rest of the things Jesus stands for, not so interested. If, if that's the way we think about Jesus and faith, we're not coming close to saving faith. So my argument in this book, what is saving faith? And the subtitle is just as important. Reflections on receiving Christ as a treasure. My argument in this book is that we must receive Christ as a treasure if receiving him as Savior and Lord is real. Or a better way to say it would be, I receive him as a treasured Savior. I receive him as a treasured Lord, treasured friend. I receive him for all that he is, all that God is for me in him. So it's a receiving grace and a receiving of Christ. Now, we all know that we can trust a brain surgeon, the best brain surgeon in the country. All right. Like, if you have to give, like, examples right off the bat of why you can say this thing, that's probably not great. Even if we think he's a jerk, right? He, he abuses his kids. He doesn't care for his wife. He's selfish and mishandles his finances, but he never loses a patient. He's really good. Now, if that's the way we hold to Jesus, he's a great deliverer from the cancer of hell. We don't know what saving faith is. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven Should've is like a, a man who found a treasure hidden in a field. And in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. That's saving faith at the root there. I've seen him as a treasure. I embrace him as a treasure. And oh, the difference it makes in all the choices of my life. Paul said, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he puts a name on that surpassing value. He calls it a treasure. This is why I love the treasure language. He yeah, said, we, <laughs> we have this treasure in jars of clay. Everything Jesus is, all of his offices, all of his words, all of his deeds, all of his character, everything is moving toward the glorification of Jesus and the satisfaction of the human soul. And here's what the book intends to get across. God has appointed saving faith as that unique and peculiar act of the soul by which we receive Christ as a treasure and thus glorify him, and by which in receiving him as a treasure, satisfy our own souls. So in one unique divine gift of God called saving faith, God is glorified in us and we are satisfied in him. There it is. And what I've tried to do in this book is demonstrate and celebrate that everything I've just said is in the Bible. <laughs> it's not, I'm not winging it here. These are not my ideas. This is God's revelation. And I believe it's a message that the world and the church desperately needs. Okay. Um, I should have trimmed that. That was a long thing. So thanks for sticking with me on that. Um, I want to know what your thoughts are on it, but I'm viewing this thing and it just sounds so much like Lordship salvation. It, it's just like a different form of it. It's instead of like submitting yourself to the Lordship of Christ. Um, I, I would say that this seems very much like, you know, un, an 
affectionate kind of way of doing that, like an emotional, like submitting yourself to Christ. Um, like <laughs> when you start adding things like this, like you show like, okay, maybe we should have been far more concerned with this, like, um, this Christian hedonism thing. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. Um, I remember having a conversation with one of my Bible college student or, uh, teachers and, uh, great guy, uh, probably the best that they had. And we were sitting in his office and you know, I would just go and I would chill and chat with him. Um, but you know, we were talking about Piper cause it's, it's in Southern Minnesota and I was talking about my concern <laughs> over, like, I don't like that phrase, uh, at least when it comes to, uh, outside of the Christian walk. Like, I think if we're talking about like as Christians, then I think in a way I could agree with God being most glorified in a Christian's life through their satisfaction in him. And like, as they savor Christ, I think, I think that is like something that you can say. But when it comes to like unchristian, I remember like having debates with my Bible college professor like back in the day about like I don't think that's accurate, you know, and just in general. Um, but it's this is his effect. He had this viewpoint, and now it's affecting like this first tier issue of salvation, and he's adding in affections. At least it seems that way. And I want to read the book because I'm like. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I'm very concerned about the direction of this book and what it could mean for the, the Ordus Ludus, how you are saved. Um, it, it seems very troubling to me because when I look at John three fifteen, it's look unto Jesus and be saved. It's not look unto Jesus and either submit yourself to his Lordship or look unto Jesus and love him more than anything. Then you can be saved. Like that's, like we're talking about justification like this is not at least from the sound you know from what i've read about reviews of, of this book and what he's talking like it doesn't sound like he's talking about sanctification guys it looks like he's sounding about like he's talking about justification that initial moment of salvation and if you're going to talk about it that way that you must love jesus more than anything that is a legalism a uh, legalistic view of love like the uh, uh, and a legalistic view of salvation like that is a truly a fundamentalist trope of of just being like you have to do things in order to be saved you either have to stop drinking like back in the 20s <laughs> got to stop drinking you got to look a certain way or you need to submit to his lordship with the lordship controversy stuff and now here an emotional controversy thing of you must love jesus more than anything well, when you're first coming, like, I mean, just think about, like, always the example. The, the, the example that we always go to is the thief on the cross. Because that is, like, the bare minimum of what it means to be saved. Because he didn't have, to, he didn't go down. Like, uh, for, you know, anyone who would say that baptism is salvific. He didn't go and get baptized. You know? So, you don't have to be baptized in order to be saved. Because Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And he didn't know a whole lot about Jesus. Truly, not enough to love him more than anything. He just saw him, recognized, that's that's the Messiah. I need to be saved. And I'm going to trust in you. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Like, that's, that's the example that we all need to look to. Not to other passages. Look to, like, the bare minimum of the thief on the cross. And understand what it means to be saved. Look unto him and be saved. That's what John 3.15 says. Like, Adding anything is adding to the gospel. And I don't want to say that about John Piper. I, I am halting a little bit and saying I'm not going to come to a conclusion, a firm conclusion, until I read this book for myself. But this is so troubling. And I view it as like, oh, he came up with this mantra of Christian hedonism. And now that, like what I would have said is part of sanctification, or at least that's the way he always talked about it beforehand. Now it's crept up into this first tier issue. And I view that as a fundamentalist trope. Um, so I'm very concerned about this book. I would like to know what you guys think. Um, 
But let's see what you guys are saying here. Oh, that's so nice, man. You're the best. Jeffrey, well, you're the best. Thanks for saying that, man. Uh, Christian, I feel the ground shaking with triggered folk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's probably a lot of that going on today. But I want to be honest, you know, about where I'm at on these things. Uh, Jenna, growing to love Jesus in a, uh, is a major part of the post-salvation growth. Yeah, I probably only kind of like Jesus at first. We grow into love, right? Like you don't just immediately, once you meet someone, love them. Like, so are you saying that justification is way later on? You know, once someone understands the gospel, believes the gospel, and as they progress into loving Jesus, then like, like how far is that? You know, when are they saved? And how much do you have to love Jesus in order to be saved? Like, these are the questions that begin to come. Like, it's, you just like pull one string and it unravels, right? Like, I'm really hoping it is not what he kind of clearly is saying here, but hopefully it's different. Uh, hi, kind of new here, by the way, of Ruslan. Cool. Uh, Piper's book seems off because it seems he's emphasizing feeling. I don't feel love or whatever I'm, or whatever I'm not saved triggers my workspace fundamentalist mindset, right? Same here. Uh, do you have a video on the Lordship love debate in regards to salvation? No, I don't. I probably should make that video, but I haven't made that video. Never heard of that, but that would kind of turn what I know about salvation on its head. Always thought that was necessary. Uh, maybe I will make that video. Uh, Sarah, whoa, you are blowing my mind right now. I've never heard of anyone not believing in the things Piper is saying or MacArthur is saying. It makes sense now that you say legalism. Yeah, uh, I, I'm i viewing these things through my own lens. <laughs> you know, like I can only speak for myself. And when I look at these things, it, it to me, it screams legalism as far as like the Lordship of Christ, submitting to his Lordship. It's a second thing you need to do. When the Bible is very clear, believe. And this is coming from a Calvinist. <laughs> you must believe in order to be saved. Uh, here, it's you must believe and love Jesus. And how much do you love Jesus? What is like, there has to be some kind of measuring thing. Like all these things, when you start adding on, you're just talking about like doing more, doing more, doing more. And that is legalism. That is fundamentalism. Like at, at the core of fundamentalism is legalism. That you're being legalistic about these second tier issues and making them more primary. And then you're being legalistic about how others are doing it and saying that they're, you know, they're liberals or they're heretics because they're doing it differently. Um, so we need to be like super careful about these things and make sure, you know, are we being legalistic about certain things? Because uh, you don't know when it's going to pop up. And I am very concerned about this book, guys. I'm so concerned. Um, Sarah, I have... I have felt like there is a bit of a rat race and a pressure to prove how much you love Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. You can feel that pressure a lot of times. Um, could the same be said in understanding God's love for us? I find it hard to wrap my head around, but often feel like I must be wrong because I don't always grasp it or fully appreciate it like I want. Uh, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. Um, but yeah, if we're talking about love and salvation, it's God who loves us, right? <laughs> like God first loved us and then we love him, but it's after, like it is not part of it. Uh, so would Lordship come at a crisis moment, a specific point in your walk where you surrender to the Lordship of Jesus or come to an understanding that he is Lord? Yeah. A lot of these people would say that. And the thing about that, that's like kind of just shocking is that, like the speaking in tongues thing, which I do need to talk about, um, like at some point I need to discuss it. Um, but so many of these guys would be like, of course, like speaking in tongues is, you know, like being evidence of the Holy Spirit. That's how some charismatics and Pentecostals would, would put it, that it's, it's a requirement of being saved. And of course they would look at that and be like, no, that's like a second thing you got to do in order to be saved. But then they're like, you have to submit to his lordship or you have to love him more than anything. You must treasure him. Like, and, and it's just another form of that, isn't it? Or at least that's, that's how I'm looking at it. Maybe, maybe I'm the one out to lunch, you know, I don't know. Joel, I think it's easy to look past the bare minimum when you've been saved for a long time. 
It's hard to look back to the first moments of salvation after years of sanctification. Yeah. And I think a lot of people like you, you hear this often with like pastors and their examples. And it's hard sometimes when you've been saved for a long time to be able to give like practical like applications and, and, or to depict things the way they really are, because you're looking back through the lens of, you know, 30 years of being a Christian or, you know, especially like for a pastor being, you know, Piper, I don't know, what is it like 40 years of pastoral ministry? And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to look back. All right. Um, I guess I mean, if it takes time for us to grow in love for God, it is it reasonable to assume that it takes time to understand his love for us? Does that emotional pressure go both ways in legalism? You know, I don't know. That's a good question. You know, um, I, I think it does take time to understand God's love for us. I don't understand it. You know, I've been a Christian since I was 10 years old. So then I still don't fully understand his love for me. Um, but I know he loves me. But I, I'm not sure what else you would mean by that. But uh, I think that that would be just common. You, you don't fully understand God's love for you. Um, and you probably never will until you're in glory. Um, but you're learning more and more about how much he loves you. Uh, how, how secure his love is for us. Uh, as you said... The Lordship is part of the sanctification journey. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that. Um, that you are submitting to Jesus um, in your life. You know, it's it's like if you were to really hold to the Lordship thing that you got to submit to his Lordship in order to be saved, well, then we'd all be perfect. You know, <laughs> like, it, like then you can't sin. You submitted to his Lordship and it's over. <laughs> like, it doesn't make logical sense for me. And neither does this thing about loving people or uh, loving Jesus and understanding like that he is like you treasure him more than anything. I think that's his Christian hedonism affecting a primary doctrine, at least from what he says. And maybe the book is so much different and all like the promotional stuff has just been mishandled. Maybe that's the case. I'm hoping that's the case because I'm very scared about where this line of thinking will lead. But that's just me. Uh, I do need to get out of here, guys. I appreciate you guys being here. If you haven't hit the like button and you're still watching, please hit that like button. It means a lot to me. And it does mean a lot for the future of this video, whether other people will see it and the channel can grow and all that kind of stuff. And if you're new to the channel, do think about subscribing. I also have a newsletter. There's a link in the description of this video. Uh, hit that and you can sign up for the newsletter. A newsletter should be coming out on sunday i think is the 15th um, but if you haven't done it yet you know sign up and once you do uh, you can read the first newsletter and that has a video so you can uh, every newsletter at the bottom is going to have an exclusive video that you can go and watch it's not listed on my youtube and you won't be able to find it anywhere except through that newsletter and really the newsletter is all about just trying to build up you know a core group of people uh, that are, you know, supporting me in this, in this channel. Uh, you know, I don't want to do Patreon and buy me a coffee quite yet. Um, but that's, that's the best way to support me in this channel is to sign up for the newsletter. And that just kind of helps me to understand who my audience is a little bit and who I can rely on and try to build the base a little bit to know, you know, if we're going to have some guests on the show that, you know, people are going to show up, you know? Because sometimes that's scary. Hitting that live button is sometimes really scary. Because is anyone going to show up today? You don't know. Uh, but thanks to the newsletter, I kind of do know that there are a few of you guys who are really passionate about uh, my channel. And I really do appreciate that. That is still uh, so crazy to me. I'm so thankful. Um, but anyways, uh, I'm going to have another video dropping probably on Thursday about marijuana. Oh, snap. Dean's talking about weed. What is he going to say? Is he going to trigger more people? Maybe. Probably not. I don't know. We're going to talk about Christians' marijuana. Whether Christians should smoke weed. Can they smoke weed to the glory of God? It's a question. You'll find out the answer on Thursday. Anyways, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I hope your week's getting started right. And I will see you in the next video. See you guys.